Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Just to make sure you're in the right place, this should be that you've signed up to, because uh, you never know, uh, an LBQ webinar where we're talking about staff shortages. We're going to kick off formally in about 10 or 20 seconds or so. Um, so just bear with us. Um, I'm sure you're all uh, Zoom pros. Uh, the chat box, the, your comments, your questions come to me only. So that just um, allows everybody to focus on... Uh, the discussion. Uh, there's no slides. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a talking heads, sharing ideas, and those types of things. So if you're um, familiar with the Zoom, I'll just put um, hello in the chat box. There you go. So you can see where that is. So the messages come to me. And uh, this recording will be shared. So it'll be circulated through the Eventbrite ticket page. And we'll stick it on our YouTube channels too. So it's just gone past four o'clock. Uh, I'm going to kick off formally. Um, so welcome. My name's Ross McGill. I'm um, on Teacher Toolkit, a uh, former school leader, a bit of a blogger, and I've got a little small audience online where I like to kind of share lots of ideas. And uh, when I'm not struggling with my doctoral degree, I am physically and more increasingly digitally in the schools supporting teacher training and trying to find out great ideas that make a difference to our teachers and to our young people uh, in schools all over the country. Um, I'm lucky enough to be joined by two experts still on the front lines. So I'm going to introduce them in a moment. Now, if I just give you a heads up, I want you to introduce yourself, your role, and tell us something interesting about yourself that's not related to school. Um, so uh, let me just formally kick things off. Um, the title of this session is Dealing with COVID Staff Shortage Issues. Now, in my former life as a school leader, managing cover for uh, a secondary school in Westminster, London, 250 staff, 2,000 pupils, was a headache day to day at the best of times. Throughout COVID, I suspect it is a bit of a nightmare. And after two years of perhaps dealing with this, there are certain things that we can do to optimize and reduce margins, et cetera, and make things a little bit easier. But how do you make sure that learning is still happening when there are fewer teachers to do the teaching? I uh, was looking at a few uh, government announcements earlier today, the average is about 10% of staff absences at the moment. So um, it'd be interesting to hear what Sam and Alicia have to say in terms of their attendance patterns for staff. And like many schools across the country, uh, we'll hear from Sam St. Bede's Roman Catholic Primary School has been hit with staff shortages as well and their attendance issues because of the pandemic. And this has led to a variety of issues in and out of the classroom, whether it's widening learning gaps. Um, we know people are focusing on curriculum changes and supporting pupils with their uh, mental health. So we'll have, I'm gonna ask Sam to introduce himself first, and then we'll also hear from Alicia Shaw, who works at the Shine Learning Trust. So um, Alicia, if you can tell us a little bit more about the trust and how you're also dealing with the shortages, and then we'll get into the formality of going through uh, a lot of questions I want to post and just to unpick um, some of the issues and some of the solutions that we've been dealing with. And then for people watching, um, people watching live, pose your questions in the chat box. They come to me only and I'll ask them on your behalf. And we'll also talk about the wonderful um, LBQ software, which uh, uh, we're fortunate enough they're hosting this event and have brought us all together. And I'll talk about my experiences of using that software as well as hearing from Sam and Alicia. So um, that's enough from me. Um, Sam, can I ask you first? Uh, you, your role, and, and something uh, interesting and uh, outside of education, what, what keeps you uh, excited and motivated and looking after your mental health in particular? Hello, everyone. I'm just going to move because the light centre has just said that I've gone to sleep, so I'm just... <laughs> Brilliant. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm Sam. I'm a Deputy Head, yes, teacher, and Senko at a Catholic Primary School in Newcastle, Central Newcastle, just at the outskirts. Um, love my job. What's interesting to me about me outside of ed education? I'm a new dad, got a six month old daughter who slept in her own room this weekend. So That's fantastic. The, the bags are slightly smaller today. Um, and I'm also a Newcastle United fan, and that's certainly uh, I don't know if exciting is the right word. Uh, it's certainly it's a, a challenge emotion. over the last few months. Keep your emotions busy, but um. Yeah, congratulations on becoming a parent. Uh, I suspect now you realise what real tiredness is uh, compared to day to day teaching. Yeah. Uh, right, thank you, Sam. Uh, Alicia. Hi, uh, so I'm Alicia Shaw. I work at Shine. Um, we are a charity based in Leeds. 
and um, our aim is to uh, reduce the attainment gap between um, uh, kids from low income families and their more affluent peers and we particularly focus on the north of England. Um, we are a grant giving charity, so we give grants to uh, schools and to teachers who have got innovative ideas about how they can reduce that gap. So if you've got any innovative ideas, have a look at our website or uh, feel free to get in touch with one of us. Um, we give grants um, of various different sizes to, to projects lasting up to three years. Um, we don't work directly with schools, uh, so we haven't sort of had the, the impact of staff absences that I'm sure Sam has, although members of our team have been off since Christmas uh, because of COVID. Um, but we do hear a lot from the schools that we work with about the challenges that they're having and the delays that are happening to the projects that they're trying to run because of, of the challenges of staffing and attendance, um, kids attendance as well, and parents coming into the school uh, because of COVID. Um, and something interesting about me, um, I guess that something that I do that um, I find really helps with my mental health is getting outside a lot, uh, going for walks and sort of getting into nature. Fantastic. I, was gonna, I thought you were going to forget that and I wasn't going to let you off the hook. So thank <laughs> you, Alicia, for sharing that. Um, I guess from me, um, having lived and worked in London for 30 years, um, I'm one of those that left the big smoke uh, in the pandemic. So I'm now in Halifax, West Yorkshire. And I absolutely love the outdoors up here. So, you know, further away you move from uh, the southeast, the more space. Um, so my favourite word at the moment is diaphanous. And I think it's because I've been learning more about nature and planting lots of trees and all sorts of things and really enjoying the outdoors. Um, right, let's get into some formalities. Um, so, Sam, we'll start with you. Um, what, what's the situation at St. Bede? So tell us a little bit about the school, your demographics, etc., and how it reflects the kind of national struggle that all schools have been through, particularly the last 18 months? Yeah, so we are the West End in Newcastle, which is a real, it, I, I describe it as like a melt, melting pot, really. We've got all sorts of different children from all sorts of different backgrounds. We're about 25% people premium, 25% English as additional language, um, got a higher than average amount of children on the SEN register um a, a growing number of pupils with autism uh, that's a bit of context for us um we're right in the middle of a council estate we've got no green space whatsoever which provides other challenges um and in terms of the picture over the last couple of years it's been really tough our families have really struggled our, our schools really struggled um and as much as maybe we're okay budget wise it's taken a real hit over the last sort of particular the last few terms with absences of staff. Um, we're a close-knit family. And then one of us goes down, we don't just suffer in terms of worrying about that member of staff being off. We're also suffering because that means cover is pulled. You know, your, your support staff is no longer your support staff. They're doing someone else's job. I think myself and the head over the last two years have been cooks, we've been cleaners, we've been caretakers, we've been in men, we've been, you know, you name it, we've done it. Yeah. Um, all hours of the day and I'm sure I'm, I'm speaking to many people who are in a, a similar situation um we've had various outbreaks where children have you know have picked up COVID and it's spread and we've had you know quite a few children off we've had times where you know we're waiting for PCR results but we're feeling fit and healthy but we can't be in school we've had all of these things that everyone's gone through and it's been a real been a real tough place to be it's made everyone question um whether what they're doing is the right thing to do it's made everyone look you know look for answers you know i'm fortunate enough i'm quite active online and i'm looking around on twitter to see what else is going on out there but i know lots of schools in our area aren't as connected as as maybe as we are and it can be a really lonely place it can be an ice you know an isolated profession at the minute where you, you, you know you're reading the press and teachers are getting a bit of a battering and then you go into work and you're really up you, against uh, it anyway part of a trust sam your school yeah we've just we've recently joined um a, a, a bigger multi-academy trust as part of the catholic schools up here and uh, the, the newcastle sort of local authority kind of disbanded a few years ago and so um lots of the support that lots of local authorities might give we we don't really get here you have to look privately for that and when you look for private support you can face different kinds of challenges and different kind of hurdles so yeah we are part of the academy trust and we're starting to see the benefits of that now 
Um, as so, I say, we're, we're only six months in. Right. So, I mean, I, I guess the earlier part of the pandemic, you could have, you know, you could have quite rightly felt quite isolated as a, as a staff body. Um, in terms of the uh, reminders of the kind of demographics, you still not, uh, how many form entry are you in? One form entry. Um, we haven't got a nursery, but we've got 200, 210 kids from reception to six. Okay, lovely. Uh, so I'll come back to you, Sam. Thanks for that. That's interesting context. Um, Alicia, um, you know, your insights, you know, supporting lots of different schools across the country. Um, what, what's the national picture? You know, we've heard lots of stories about disadvantaged kids being left behind. What, what insights have you uh, unpicked uh, from Shine uh, based in Leeds? Um, yeah, well, as, as you both said, um, the picture on the media and on social media gives you a pretty good but bleak picture bleak idea of what's happening so um, as Ross said before the survey seemed to be suggesting between 10 and 20 percent of staff are absent um, and that's pretty reflective of the sort of conversations that we're having with schools so uh, for example I spoke to a teacher in a secondary school in Leeds the other day who uh, spoke about the fact that they've got uh, 10 teachers and seven um, teaching assistants off due to COVID at the moment really struggling to get any supply cover and so that's obviously really affecting the learning of the children at their school as it is having an effect on sort of thousands of children um, across the north. Um, yeah, it's, it's just an ongoing challenge, isn't it, with the, the lack of staff and the challenges with supply, with finding supply staff. Um, and we all know that it's resulting in children potentially having to be sent home for online learning or having to schools having to combine classes and year groups so that they can they can teach the schools uh, teach the children sorry um, and for the children who are being sent home um, it affects all children but it seems to affect disadvantaged children more profoundly than children from more affluent homes um, National uh, analysis of data nationally shows that the attainment gap has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and there's loads of different reasons for that. Um, it's been a really challenging pand pandemic for everybody, but I think we can see the challenges if you are living in a low income, fam in a low income household with less resources, um, potentially with less time. And the online learning has been really challenging for a lot of kids from low-income families because of lack of resources, um, lack of, lack of um, access to the internet has really sort of deepened that, um, that attainment gap. Um, I don't know if anybody saw some data that was presented by the um, FFT Education Data Lab last week about the differences in absences between children from low-income families and those from uh, more affluent families that the, the kids who in uh, the FSM6 group had much higher levels of absence and were much more likely to have had really, really long periods of absence than their more affluent peers. And so it's all just adding to this picture where we already had a, a, a gap, um, an attainment gap that was not acceptable before the pandemic for lots of different reasons. And the pandemic and has, has just exacerbated it. Um, Alicia, what kind of um, things have schools been getting in contact with you about in terms of what are their kind of urgent needs that you where you would normally uh, the kind of support that you would offer as a trust? Um, so we we um, tend to offer support, as I said, around innovative ideas to reduce the education gap. Um, we tend to focus on the transition into primary school. And the transition from primary to secondary school because we know that those are really fundamental areas where the gap can grow and where it's really important to make sure that kids from low-income families are keeping up. Um, we've been hearing from schools that um, especially the sort of the nursery settings and reception sessions that we talk to the staff are really concerned that that gap is is bigger than they've ever seen before um, that everybody's coming in sort of the average level of language and communication and and social skills that kids are coming up in with is sort of lower on average but that particularly for the kids from disadvantaged families um i was talking to a, an early years teacher from blackpool recently who was saying that she's really noticed that children from low-income families are coming in with much lower levels of communication and language that they did in the past and it's always a good reminder that you know if you think of a a year three student they've not they've had two years of you know no uh, steady schooling at all um, mm -hmm. that impact on all the different year groups 
um, is clear to see. Um, Sam, if I come back to you, thank you, Alicia. Um, how, how have you coped with staff shortages? So, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you can give us some statistics, you know, staff attendance and things like that over the last couple of years or this term, uh, and come with some of the strategies that you're you're doing to deal with these problems. Yeah, um, I haven't necessarily got numbers off the top of my head, but I've got sort of anecdotes that staff shortages have come in different ways. So we've had some people who have been ill themselves, who are often, you know, and understandably ill, and maybe it's longer than the, the two weeks of the old isolation period. And we've had some staff who are off intermittently, whether they're going for PCR tests or they've been close contact or whatever. It feels like when we talk about this pandemic, it's like various different eras, isn't it? And some of them feel like a lifetime ago. So juggling that, short-term absences whether it's a day or an afternoon or you know a couple of days while waiting for a result or whether it's a prolonged absence it's been a real balancing act um we're lucky that we've got a couple of members of staff who are um hlts who can swoop in and do some cover and we kind of felt a bit of a responsibility at the same time to not reach out to supply teaching as much um i guess in the early stages we were like we don't necessarily want new staff coming into the school we don't want to put them at risk we don't want to put our community at risk it was a real it was like a moral decision isn't it to decide whether we're going to try and bring somebody else in to help with these you know staff shortages in, in school or whether we're going to you know close the doors and keep you know outsiders out you know what i mean um so we've tried to use as much cover as possible we've used goodwill of staff a lot of the time where you're losing that extra member of staff in your class and as, as alicia has just said you know, that's also impacting on our children from those, you know, low income families, our SEN children, things like that, who've got this designated support. It's been really hard. And there's never been a case where I felt that we've done everything right. We've had to make sacrifices. You know, I had a teaching assistant full time. Um, and then for a, a number of months, because of various cover, one after the other, after the other, I lost my support. So I was teaching solo. And as a deputy head in Senko, you know, that's going to have an impact on me. So I'm working more more into the, you know, into the afternoons and the evenings because I've got so much stuff to do because I've missed my my leadership time. So we've been looking really for whatever we can to try and pull back some of that control and make sure that the learning's still taking place and make sure that staff are feeling valued. We've tried our best to scrap direct the time for an ex extended period of time so staff have got a little bit more freedom to leave a bit earlier after school is a bit of a well-being boost we've pulled in things and i know we'll go on to talk about it more pulled in things like learning by questions that is a bit of a time to it's a massive time saver in terms of planning and assessment and ensuring that that learning is still taking place You've, we've really had a box clever um and it, it's not it's not been easy and it's still not easy but you know the, the whole time there's a few things at play the kids have missed out on a lot. You said there that some of the, you know, my year sixes didn't have a, a full year of school since year three. Um, so they've missed out a lot on learning. We've got, a, you know, a real catch up agenda, recovery curriculum, whatever you want to call it. We need to make sure that's happening. We've got staff who are already on their knees because they've worked so hard. And we've got, you know, we've got to look after them too. They've, they've been through it. Um, and then we've got the families who are really relying on us to, to, to understand the situation. Some of them are scared still. Some of them, you know, are worried about their children being back even now, two years on. Um, yeah, spinning plates, really. I am, so I know LBQ really well, but maybe one or two people watching are, are not familiar with um, this as a potential solution to help with staff shortages, keep learning going online as well as in school. Could you give us a little synopsis of what it is and what can it do? It's, um, it's basically... Uh, it's, it's basically a, a, a complete teaching tool. So it's a bank of question sets which cover all different, you know, shapes and sizes, lessons, particularly English, maths and, and science. Um, I can set a question set online for my kids, the click of a button. It'll distribute a code onto my screen. The children log on on whatever device they've got. We're lucky enough to be part of the Shine project where we've got some so tablets in our class that are specific for our learning by questions. Um, the kids log on, take the code, they access this, you know, this question set. They work through it at their own pace. They're given prompts, they're given little reminders. It self um, assesses marks. It moves them on at their own pace. Um, it gives me instant feedback. 
through through my teacher screen so I can see who's doing well, who's struggling, who needs support. I can pause the lesson, bring it up on screen, use it as a teaching point. It's, it is all encompassing. So I've got questions set already that are of a great standard of all different sort of levels and abilities. I've got access to the kids on a one-to-one -one level. And then it's got that instant feedback yeah. for me I mean, and I, the kids. I, I, so I, I, I know LBQ. Um, it's a fabulous bit of software. I think the best thing is, one, it saves you marking. Two, it, it really put, holds kids to account and, and helps with their learning journey. And that immediate assessment that you get as a teacher on your dashboard is just fabulous. Um, I know there's LBQ uh, kind of staff in this session watching. Maybe they can correct me. But last time I... I believe 60 to 80,000 questions on their database. I think at least maybe uh, might be one or two off, but um, it's a fun, phenomenal resource. So if you're not familiar with it, do check it out. Um, Sam, what's pupil attendance been like for you at St. Bede's? Um, and although you've used LBQ to support that and many other things, um, what's been your attendance like throughout the pandemic? Um there was a massive day last Friday where I had a full class for the first time this year. Right, wow. Um, which just sort of il illustrates it, and it's it's kind of the theme throughout the school. Um, I know the figures that Alicia was talking about earlier on were definitely were definitely different, dipping beneath that um, that national figure. Um, I would say at its worst, classes have had up to sixteen children off. At its best, we've probably only had one or two up in each class. Like I say, we've never, I had my class full for the first time last week and the schools never had all children in, not even on the first day of term. Um, we're talking in the 80s percentage wise, which is really, which is really sad. It is, yeah. And it, I mean, it reflects that national picture, um, I suppose. Uh, I'm going to come back to you, Sam, on LBQ and preparing for SATs and your thoughts on exams and stuff. And uh, uh, I'll jump back to Alicia. Um, you know, we know schools struggle financially. Um, we know budgets are not enough, and we know a lot of schools haven't been picking up the flack for you know cover budgets, etc. I, I, I guess the question is, when it comes to tablets and resources, um, what can Shine do to support our schools? Could you tell um, people watching a little bit more about the kind of things that you can offer? Yeah, definitely. So. Um... A few years ago, Shine awarded a grant to Learning by Questions uh, for schools specifically in the Northeast um, so that they can access Learning by Questions um, and they've got sort of the funding to do that. So the grant allows schools in disadvantaged areas to access the resources they need to take part in um, the project and to trial using LBQ. Um, We've spoken about sort of what LBQ is. It's an online tool which um, gives children question sets and then immediate feedback on how they've done. Um, so obviously to be able to, to use that, you need to have some kind of um, tablet or laptop or computer, desktop computer that the children can use. Um, so our funding allows, um, uh, provides uh, teachers with the, um, the, uh, I think they're all tablets, aren't they? Sorry, um, yeah. uh, they're all tablets and um, that pupils can use and they um, provide some of the funding towards um, the LBQ subscription as well. So uh, there's seven uh, slots still available for schools in the Northeast to have this funding so that they can trial LBQ, they get all the technology that they need. Um, and so, yeah, um, get in touch with um, Alicia. Yeah. The school leader think, right, I can get some money and when's the deadlines? Yeah. Uh, what, what do I need to do? Where do I need to go? Any links, anything like that you can share? So um, you need to get in touch with um, not Sam Keys, but Sam uh, Wainwright, who um, is currently hasn't got his screen on, but you can get in touch with Sam. Um, and Sam will be able to, um, to talk to you about whether or not you meet our criteria and um yeah how you can move forward with that okay so we'll share the links in the ticket list uh, if you've signed up to this to watch this live and uh, people watch um, and it, we'll the link in the, the the kind of details sorry alicia um you yeah, know just the sooner those seven slots are filled up the better from our point of view because we want kids to be accessing this this great um intervention as soon as they can but we're certainly hoping that all of them will be filled up by the summer so, right, uh, so there you yeah. go. So get some funding and some devices. Fantastic. Thank you, Alicia. Um, Sam, I'll come back to you. Um, 
you know, costs for schools, managing your budget, you know, me, my life as a kind of school leader and then evolving into a blogger, seeing all these resources come my way and all these ed tech solutions for years. And then obviously through the pandemic, there's been an explosion of them all. Um, we've all got a good understanding of how much they cost and what value they have. And, and obviously we want to use things that we know will make a difference, et cetera. Um, I guess lots of questions. How does LBQ compare to other things that you use? You know, the kids, the things that kids are logging into daily and, you know, is it good value for money? Yeah. Um, I'll start by saying just quickly that shine project, it was a, a revelation for us and it was so easy to go through the, the hoops that we needed to go through to get, get on board with that. So definitely if you're in the Northeast, not too much paperwork. It, no, not at all. And we haven't got time. You know what it's like. Yeah, our email boxes, inboxes are full of, as you said, all of these solutions that are going to be the game changers that are going to save our time, our money, all of this sort of stuff. Yeah. And ultimately, if it doesn't stick, it's not going to work, is it? And if it costs too much, we can't afford it. Yeah. So learning my questions, and again, I don't work for them. I'm just an advocate. I started, like many people do with, with learning my questions, I saw Mr. Booth on Twitter years ago telling me that it was brilliant. I did a little trial. Um, before the SATs one year, the kids loved it. So automatically there was buying from them. It was saving me loads of time. It was getting me away from that photocopier. So I decided to, to, to sign up. And just as it happened, as I was going to sign up, the Shine project had a space, so we went for it. You try all of these different products that, like I say, claim to be the, the next big thing. This is the cheapest of the products that we've signed up for, and it's had the most impact. Um, oh, yeah. to, put it in, to put it in simple terms and like I said the, the kids love it so it does become a daily thing um, like I've said before it's saving me time it's saving the school money and it's 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 really led to some great games with the kids yeah have you found yourself you know where you've had to you know collapsing classes and team teaching or in the hall you know the usual scenarios yeah there's been different setups like that there was one scenario where um, I was waiting for PCR results and I was absolutely fitting well, fine, but I couldn't be in school. But I knew that I needed to teach. It was a, it was a fractions lesson. I knew that I'd teach something before I came back to school the, the next day, other day after, whenever these results came. And I knew that I could have learning by questions on. I could set the questions set from home. I emailed the, the code to my, um, my teaching assistant who was in the class. She ran the lesson. Um, I had the data, so I knew that the next day that my, my lesson was fine. I, you know, at one point in the pandemic, I wasn't allowed to see books for 72 hours or something like that. They had to be quarantined because of the various rules going on. Yeah. And then I was like, so I'm teaching this lesson on Monday. I don't know how they've got on until Thursday, but I've got to teach Tuesday and Wednesday in between. You just have to, you have to change the way you do things and learning by questions let us do that because I had that instant feedback. And I could plan, you know, plan accordingly. Yeah. Are you um, are you now in a position where all your kids have access to a device, at least in school? We're not the whole school. We're, we're in a, a lucky position where we've got lots of devices. But because of the learning by questions devices that we've got part, as part of the Shame Project, mm -hmm. my class have got them, you know, all through the day, every day. Which means right. that if, you know, sometimes you plan to use learning by questions and that's going to be the main part of your lesson. Sometimes it's like, oh, my days, they've flown through that task. Um, I need to give them more. Mm -hmm. Learning by questions is there and the tablets being there has been great. Sometimes you have some children that maybe need something slightly different and learning by questions has got that in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Saves me having to go to the photocopy for another task. You know, one example was when I did uh, start the fractions topic, I was, I was doing this lesson on equivalent fractions and I sort of did my introduction as I've done for however many years I've been in year six. And I had a couple, well, I had many blank faces looking at me and I was like, hang on a second, what's going on here? And one of the children says, what are those numbers with the line in between? And I said, do you mean a fraction? They said, yeah. And I said, and I, I, st I stopped for a moment and I thought, right, their last full year in school was year three. Well, they will have had fractions introduced in a basic level. Yeah. Year four, um, they left halfway through. Fractions hadn't been taught. The year five teachers plowed so much effort into the basic skills that fractions probably been scraped or missed off. Some of these year six kids hadn't seen what a fraction was. And I had this worksheet that was year six level equivalent fractions. And I thought, well, I can't give them that. Yeah, well, so, I, my, my son's in year six now. And, and I know that, you know, you know, he's one example of millions of kids, but he, he was, he loved maths, but he, he's a bit uh, maths averse now, to be fair, because of that routine being destroyed in some respects. I guess on the question of preparing for SATs and things like that, Sam, um, how are your year six 
you know, let's ignore the thoughts about sats and all that. You know, what, what you're doing day in, day out to just get kids in a better place and, you know, that sat preparation, et cetera. What, what, what does all that look like? I'm a massive advocate of not making schools sat factories and not plowing papers into them every five minutes. You know, yes, they need to see what they look like and be comfortable with that before it gets to me. But I'm all about giving them that experience in a nicer way. So the fact that the kids love learning by questions and love being on those devices and love having a go, it means that I can sort of drip feed practice without it being, you know, that formal sitting down answering a test paper type thing. Oh. Um, we've got SATS boosters that we're having a um, like a, a breakfast club three days a week where it's voluntary and the kids come in. We use learning by questions for that. Really nice, friendly environment where the kids enjoy being there. Um, yeah, we try to give them as diverse an experience as possible without, you know, plumbing, plowing past papers in front of their face. And, and um, give me a sense of kind of your general staff. You know, I suspect staff are exhausted, but I know teachers as ever are always up for the challenge and, and go above and beyond. Um, what, what's the mood on the ground in your school? Yeah, we're a real team. We're, I'm really lucky to have the staff that we have in school. Everyone's chipping in, everyone's helping out. Interventions are happening, you know, all, all over the place. Um, we're not doing it for that. We're doing it for the kids. We're doing it for the kids to be ready for their next step on their journey, which is high school, really. Um, we've got a real understanding that lots of the kids in our area have possibly suffered more than more than others and that, um, you know, we have got lots of low-income families who didn't access much through the first lockdown. Um, needed devices sent to them that maybe took a little bit longer than they should have done but that's you know that's by the by um but yeah we've, there's a real atmosphere in this school that we're a community that you know the kids come first and we need to do all we can for them mm -hmm. and often you know you know what teachers are like we often put we often put others before ourselves don't we the expense of our well-being um and we'd never we'd never make that a directive to staff but it's definitely it's definitely yeah. what they're trying to do uh I'm going to bring a list in, but Sam, I'm going to come back to you and ask you just for just general well-being things that you've done to support your staff. But uh, Alicia, you're, you're aware of what St. Bede's is doing with the funding for LBQ devices. You know, maybe not saying any names of particular schools, but could you just give us a general picture of what you see from your side in terms of how other people have used your funding, how they've deployed resources, how they're dealing with the same challenges? Um, do you mean specifically with LBQ or uh, just you know, general things that you do with Shine? But you know, maybe you've got one or two LBQ examples also. But um, not not in particular. But if you have, then even better. Um, so um, that's about LBQ. Um, so actually, before I took the job at Shine, um, I worked for a charity called the Institute for Effective Education, mm -hmm. and um, we also had a, a link with LBQ and um, ran some. Um, Ran some projects where people evaluated using LBQ in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them were disrupted by the pandemic. They started sort of in 2019, and so they didn't necessarily finish. But people used it in um, in lots of different sorts of ways. So some people used it um, specifically to target um, the transition to make sure that things were consistent uh, between schools. Some people used it as sort of making sure that. Um, once kids got to year seven, that they knew where all the kids were and where the gaps were and the kids from different primary schools could then be sort of caught up if they hadn't done a bit or made sure that everyone was engaged. So it was used for, sometimes for transition. Um, in some cases, it was used um, to, um, to focus on a really specific skill. So uh, one school really sort of was thinking about how best to um, to help kids to have really good recall of times tables and they were trialing various different options and LBQ was one of them. Um, so yeah there, there's loads of different ways that schools that I've been engaged with uh, both at Shine and previously at the IEE have, um, have used Shine, uh, used, sorry uh, LBQ. And, and, and before I come back, come back to Sam, uh, have you seen any great kind of well-being or reducing, you know, supporting staff with their attendance or absence, you know, those types in your kind of view in, in Shine Trust, anything? Um, presumably more broadly than LBQ. Yes, uh, so um, just, just general good practice or, or things that I think, oh, that's a great idea. Um, so for... Um, 
So, I, I'm yeah. putting you on the spot, so don't worry. You, you are a little bit. Um, now, I'm just trying to think of all of our different projects because um, they all do fantastic things. And I think that um, the schools that we work with generally are, are really thinking about how they support their staff and how they support wellbeing. Um, and people have done, um, yeah, various different things. I suppose that it, it depends on your staff and how you, yeah. um, what people need and what people want at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's good. So um, Sam, um, you know, what, what kind of things have you done? So I, I, I was at my, uh, my son's school yesterday as a parent governor and we were, I was in, actually in the school this morning uh, talking to them about their, or, or they were talking to me more about their well-being solutions, their staff policies, how they've adapted their marking policy, online assessment tools, their email culture, the whole kind of shebang, I suppose. Uh, what kind of things have you done throughout the pandemic to support your staff, support and teaching staff mental health? Yeah, lot, lots of the things you see in there. I said earlier, we, we removed direct time because we understood that, you know, some staff wanted to get away earlier or come in slightly later, obviously still in time to, to be ready with the kids. We um, we thought really carefully about staff meetings and how, how, how we could sort of change the focus of some of those, make some of them more online. If there's a webinar type format or a pre-recorded format, just, you know, aware of people's time. Mm -hmm. uh, we introduced PPA from home. If, if staff wanted to do that, they had that, that time and space to get away. We, um, we looked in particular classes that have been really hard hit and we employed extra support staff um, mm -hmm. as much to support the kids, but also to possibly, you know, share the workload a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, actually employed an extra teacher so that we could cover some more PPA and give some more leadership time to, you know, to dedicate to intervention and catch up as well. Yeah, we've, we've just tried, like I say, we were in a position where our budget was quite strong, so we could do that, not all schools have been it. You know. supply staff, just like uh, most of us. Yeah, it has been a struggle, and again, I said to you before, we were tackling that issue of whether we, whether we thought that was the right thing for us and our kids. So what we did was we ended up re we removed um, some of the teaching assistants and dedicated them just to intervention, and so that the classes were slightly smaller, were um, increased you know, roles and contacts of some of our staff already so they have the ability to cover uh, classes. We just tried to use the, use our staff as best we could. We did end up needing supply in the end and that was a struggle and finding finding mm -hmm. the right staff as well was a struggle. But I guess we kind of thought our staff know our kids best, their best place to support them, so that's where we're going to start. Yeah, seems to be the fault for, for, for many. Um, so people watching live, uh, here's an opportunity to either uh, pose a question in the chat box. It will come to me only, or if you're confident, uh, unmute yourself and uh, fire a question to Alicia or to Sam. So I'll give you an opportunity to do that now. Any takers? Um, Alicia, can I just pop back to you? Sorry, uh... Oh, here we go. Yes, Dave, please. Question. Oh, Emma. Come on. Oh, yeah, there I am. It's about music, actually. I'm um, a director of Northeast Music Foundation. Mm -hmm. So we supply Perry's into schools, um, you know, guitar and whatever. Mm -hmm. I just wondered how the, how schools are coping with the music provision of the found. We, we found that there's a sort of reluctance for schools to, to, to put music back on. I don't know if that's because there's a lack of teachers, teaching specialists out there. Have you found that... Uh, let's hear what Sam. Uh, how, how's your music curriculum been throughout the pandemic? I think I think you're right, Dave. I think it has definitely suffered. I think lots of the arts have suffered. Uh, the, yeah. the hardest things, I guess, to teach remotely. Um, we've got we um, have gone down the line of we're actually we've increased the amount of music that we're teaching now because we're aware that you know there's been a real deficit of that. Same with PE. Um, we've increased the amount of sport to get the children as active as possible. Um, mm -hmm. But I know from what I've heard, especially schools in our local area, there has been a shortage of, shortage of teachers. Um, and I guess, as I said before, about some of that reluctance of letting other people come into school. I know the peripatetic teachers, sometimes yeah. that's been a bit of a battle too. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going along the lines now of we've got a job to sort of pay back what what we've missed out on, um, mm -hmm. but I know not all schools are in that same position. Lysia, any, any insights from your side? Music? So our projects really focus on reducing the attainment gap between English, maths and, um, in English, maths and science. So music isn't a major focus for us, although quite yeah. a few of our early years projects do use um, 
use creative subjects to improve school readiness. So I, I'm, we certainly used to, even if we don't anymore, have a project that um, used music to, uh, and music workshops with parents to improve speech, language and communication and uh, school readiness in lots of different areas. Mm -hmm. I think, um, David, as you're probably aware, you know, the, the, I guess the earlier COVID guidance were bubbles and people being restricted to use practical spaces such as music, technology, classrooms. Yeah, of course. That obviously would have hindered your resources and your, your kind of interventions that you normally give, give back to school. Dare I say if the, you know, the, the guidance is slightly different and the vaccines are all out and things like that, we might be in a better place where you're starting to see a little bit more traffic your way, but... Um, maybe give us a picture of you know the stuff that you do and the support and um, you know your your general sense of the world at, at this stage. Yeah, it's, 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 well, it's, like I say, we're, we're just bringing around schools and trying to get music back in to sort of help schools with the music provision, really, if we can. Mm -hmm. And like we're just finding that it, it's, it was a lot quite reluctant to get them back in, you know, with with obviously the restrictions. So here's your chance. Get get give you give yourself a plug. What what website or company are we looking at? Uh, here it's, North, it's Northeast Music Foundation. Northeast Music Foundation. So there you go, yeah. folks. Um, so and we, second we, website address? Uh, www.northnemeth.co.uk. Uh, I'll read it out for you at the end, yeah? Yeah, if you could. And the other thing I'd like to just mention that we've also been developing a, 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 res a music resource for the last three years or something. We haven't gotten much. We're just getting a little bit of funding from the Arts Council recently mm -hmm. just to help with this. We we'll find it really hard to sort of get into schools to, to get this out there, but it's, the schools that are using it, they find it absolutely fantastic in terms of accelerated learning stuff. Follows a lot of the, the Rosenstein principles that you talk about a lot, you know, revisiting the learning and small yeah. chunks and everything. Yes. There's nobody else doing it quite late. It's like a video resource. We, we would like would like schools to sort of trial it out, at least. Yeah, you know what well, I mean? um, you know, and also would like, would like your opinion. Sorry? I'd like you to, to, to have a look at it, Ross, and see what your right, opinion well, is. Let's talk offline, but I want to kind of keep on right. top if that's okay. But um, yeah, no problem. Yeah, if we can, um, you know, obviously... Well, that, would, that would certainly help schools in, in terms of, like, whole class ensemble teaching. We've got, like, a resource that would really help schools yeah. with that. So no, we'll, um, we'll give you a shout-out. If you put the link, Dave, right. in the chat box, I'll read it out just at the end. But, um, yeah, right. I think the, the kind of synopsis of or the state of the nation has been, you know, practical subjects, particularly mm -hmm. creatives... And your sciences, I suppose, have had all, all of a bit of a knock on the head in the earlier stage of the pandemic. And hopefully things are opening up a little bit now. Yeah. I've got another question in thank you. the chat box. Um, thank you, Dave. Uh, to, for Alicia and Sam, um, what is the criteria for assessing the SHINE funding, Alicia? And is it related to pupil premium numbers? Um Generally speaking, yes. Uh, so our remit as a charity is to improve outcomes for children from low income families. So um, the projects that we fund are nearly always um, working in schools which have higher than average pupil premium numbers. Mm -hmm. um, if you um, are a school that's got quite low pupil premium numbers, but you've got an amazing idea, we'd be really happy to work with you, but we would need to talk to you about how you could um, deliver that or scale that to schools which are in more disadvantaged areas. Okay, so great. So thank you. And uh, um, I might have lost track of my questions, um, Alicia, but did I ask you for the seven slots? So is there a particular deadline for those slots or is it just seven funded slots to fill? There's seven funded slots to fill. Um, once they're gone, they're, they're gone. They're, so the they're deadline's gone. open until um, the last slot's gone. Um, yeah, we're hoping to get them fin uh, filled by the summer though. Okay, so if you're watching this live, folks, then, uh, you know, there's your first opportunity before I get this video recorded, uploaded onto YouTube, and it gets taken straight away. So there's your last chance. Uh, I'm going to start to wrap things up. So, um, Dave, just a reminder, if you can put your Weber link in the chat box, I'll give you a, a shout out. Um, in the chat box earlier, I put a link to uh, LBQ. Uh, you can log in. Uh, I know and have a free trial and play with some of their quizzes and questions and look at their tools. There's obviously the paid for side and there's all the kind of SATS preparation uh, that you can look at there in terms of resources. So uh, I'll put that link in the chat box again for everyone. You've heard from Sam. Uh, I think that my takeaway message from you, Sam, was, you know, a low cost, high impact. Yeah, absolutely. And 
especially schools and staff in, in the northeast, if you want to see it in action, I'm more than welcome to show you, you know, as restrictions sort of lessen, uh, you're more than welcome to come and see it in action in our school. So there you go. So there's a there's an invite too. And um, I, I, I'm up in Durham, so it's probably a little bit away from Newcastle. But um, yeah, once I get back up in the northeast, I'll come and pop in Sam on my travels and, and say hello. But I'm going to start to bring things to a formal conclusion. Um, people watching live, if you've got any other questions that you're burning to ask, this is your last opportunity. Okay, last chance, last chance. All right, so I'm gonna wrap things up. Um, so we've been talking about staff shortages, managing absences, digital devices, ed tech solutions that make a difference. Uh, plug in LBQ again. Uh, as a solution, obviously you've got the Shine Trust. Funding for schools, schools are always looking for a bit of funding. Alicia, can you reassure me that the paperwork's not too laborious for school leaders? No, we really try to make things easy at Shine. Um, as Sam said, the, um, the application process is as, as smooth as we can make it um, for the LBQ grants, but also for our grants more generally. We, we know how uh, busy teachers are. So we try to make things there easy. There you go. And if I can give you some analytics from my website, 70 seconds is the average reading time from 16 million teachers. So there you go. So 70 seconds is about 450 words. So if your application forms are short and punchy or your one-page policy, Sam, are 450 words, then you're on to a winner. Um, there's that link from Dave. So thank you, Dave. So www.add. Yeah. Add add notes a d d a that that that's actually the res what's the resources called where you can get the the website covers both companies if you like okay so yeah, I'll, I'll put you that in the link and I'll share that um and circulate it through the ticket and put it online um so yeah. I'm going to wrap things up there everybody um thank you for your precious time thank you to Alicia for your insights from Shine and from free funding what's not to like uh, there and to Sam on the front line, working tirelessly, and a new dad too. Um, uh, I hope you've mastered the nappies. <laughs> and uh, I hope you're enjoying uh, fatherhood and uh, Alicia as well, and me in, in Yorkshire now, enjoying the, the, the wonderful outdoors. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. On behalf of LBQ, uh, my name's Ross McGill, I've been your host, and I've been joined by the delightful Sam Keys and Alicia Shaw. Uh, and thanks for watching. Keep well, keep safe and see you again in the future. Bye for now.